Hello, I'm Guy Jones and I'm the founder and manager of Fog Arts, which is a digital jazz label based in Stockholm, Sweden. This is the fourth in a series of discussions I'm having with artists and others in the music world whose work I like and admire. My interviewee in this case is an extremely talented Scottish pianist called Fergus McCready. Fergus was born in Inverness in 1997 and brought up in the central Scottish town of Dollar. After finishing school four years ago, Fergus moved to Glasgow to begin his studies at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland, where he was under the tutelage of RCS's head of jazz, Tommy Smith, the saxophonist and composer. Fergus, who's still only 21, graduated from RCS in August this year, but before that, back in April 2018, released his debut trio album, the very well-received Turas. Fergus and I talked about the album, as well as the current state of Scotland's jazz scene, the similarities between Nordic and Scottish folk music, and a number of other things. I began, though, by asking Fergus when and how his interest in music came about. Well, I think I first started sort of playing and piano when I was about seven. Uh, my parents sent me to music lessons and stuff like that. Uh, but I didn't really like it because... I mean, like most children, I just didn't have the attention span. It was kind of boring, um, you know, playing classical music and reading the dots. It wasn't very fun until maybe I was about 12, 13, and I first uh, first sort of discovered jazz and saw like a jazz pianist playing, and that totally made a big difference because uh, it was like, you know, jazz was really fun and it was really exciting and it was whatever you wanted it to be. So I think from then on in, I was kind of like hooked on just playing jazz, really. And then from there on, it's been, you know, practicing and playing gigs and playing with other musicians and stuff. And I've gone back into the classical thing after hating it for so long. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that was kind of, that's how it happens for me. Okay. So what kind, what kind of music were you listening to growing up as a teenager? And, uh, or... So um, my mum used to, since I was little, my mum listened to a lot of classical music and a lot of country music as well. I don't know how much that has influenced anything. C- country and Western? Yeah, yeah country, oh, okay. like blue, bluegrass, country and Western, okay. yeah, that kind of thing. Right. Um, quite Americana stuff. Mm. Uh, but then when I was... So I did listen to a lot, listen to a lot of classical music by myself, even though I didn't like playing it. I really like listening to it. Um, I suppose it was just that thing, you know, like when you're, you know, when you look at people doing classical music, which is really hard. You kind of think, oh, I could, I could never do that. But, but anyway, uh, when I discovered jazz, that was like that's all I listened to religiously, especially you know, like Oscar Peterson, like for hours a day. Um, see, he was great, and Errol Garner and stuff like that. And then over time I've sort of started listening to more modern jazz and started branching out but as a teenager it was pretty much from about 13 onwards like straight to the jazz that I was listening to. Okay and where, where did the jazz come from because it's not easy nowadays for young people to hear jazz unintentionally is it? It's not something you stumble across that often. Yeah well I suppose like um, the f- like my first experience, my very very first experience of jazz was when I was doing you know graded piano exams yeah. um so like there would always be a piece you'd play like three pieces in your exams and one of the pieces would be a kind of written out slightly jazzy piece and that was always the one that i liked but i never really connected that with like listening to jazz and liking it and stuff okay. but i think it was seeing it live i think for so many people like jazz is much better experience live so like when you see it live that's when you think oh it's actually an amazing genre of music. Can you can um, you remember what you saw? Was it a trio or was it a solo it pianist? Was, or? It was a, so I went on a summer jazz course, kind of like just to learn about playing music and stuff like that. But uh, they start the whole week, the whole course started off with all the tutors playing in a band together. So that was like quite a few musicians. It was like trumpet, sax, trombone, guitar, you know, piano, bass, drums, and that. That tune that they, I can't remember what tune it was, but that tune that they all played together was like that was that was it that was me sold. Okay, right. <laughs> is, is that when you decided you wanted to study music after school? Um, I don't know if it was 
I don't know if the decision to study it was that quick. I think it was pretty, like, within a few months, I was like, I actually really enjoy learning music like that. And then to start, to start with, there's always that thing, like, oh, w- will it be all right? You know, it's kind of like, cause it is, there is a sort of thing about being, um, being a musician, like, it's not going to earn you much money and it's not, like, you know, a wealth, it's not a wealthy career or, or an easy career. Right. Um, and I was always quite... I was quite academic at school, um, so like to sort of take a turn and say I, want, I actually want to do music um, instead of you know veterinary. Uh, I think it was a bit. People were a bit like, "Oh, can can you manage it?" But it, it ended up being okay. Okay. Well, what, what what subjects did you study at A level? Um, so in my last year at school, I did did music obviously. I did history, chemistry. Maths and English. Okay. God, that's very unusual. In my day, we used to have to specialise in the arts or the sciences. We weren't allowed to mix them up like that. What's that, sorry? We, we weren't allowed to mix our arts and science subjects up like that when I was your age. Oh, really? No way. That's, that's strange. <laughs> I, that's, that's weird, yeah. At school, I really liked doing like a total variety of stuff. I think it was, it was good to do before, you know, exclusively doing music. So, yeah. And so what, what prompted you at that point, Fergus, to decide to go to RCS, which I should point out is the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland, which is, uh, well, probably Scotland's leading music school, isn't it? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. It absolutely is Scotland's best music school. Yeah. Um, I think it was, you know, it was a number of reasons, like, well, so firstly, it was very practical, you know, it was RCS is only an hour away from where I kind of grew up. Uh, so it was an easy move, um, because I'm from Scotland, it's free to go there, rather than going to London, where it would cost nine grand a year. Um, yeah. So that made, that was quite an obvious decision. And uh, I suppose, as well, though, like, being growing up in Scotland and stuff, you hear about the sort of names that taught at RCS, like Tommy Smith is obviously the main one, and then... The, like my piano teacher was Paul Harrison and I knew of him and I just knew that they were great musicians yeah. and I knew that I could learn more from them so I think that was kind of that was kind of what sunk the decision for me. Okay and then was it was it um, I mean I'm not quite sure how RCS works but were you, were you from the beginning um, part of the jazz faculty or were you, was your course more general than that? Yeah, um, RCS is good in that if you want to do jazz, there's a specific jazz course. So yeah, straight away I was just into the jazz course and doing classes exclusively with jazz musicians, which was nice. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. And the, the, we should point out that the jazz faculty is is headed by the one and only Thomas, Tommy Smith, shouldn't we? <clears throat> yeah. And what was what was it like studying under Tommy, who, who whose work you just said you you were already familiar with, actually. Um, it was qu- it was good. It was very good actually. Uh, he's obviously an incredible musician. Um, he pushed you really hard. I never had one to one lessons with him, which is a sort of a bit of a regret. But uh, when I had classes with him, he was just very like not ruthless, but he he knew what everyone needed to work on, so he wasn't afraid to say that. And I think that's like that's the most valuable thing a teacher can have. So yeah, okay. So, because uh, I always get that, well, I talk to other musicians and, and inevitably most of them tend to teach because, uh, you know, that's the only way they can keep their heads above water financially. And, yeah. But it's very much, they seem to regard it as a necessary evil in some cases. Whereas with Tommy, you know instantly that he has a big teaching responsibility. And uh-huh. that, uh, he's proud of that. And he, he talks about his students. I mean, I, I get the strong sense that he's very, very dedicated to to what what his guys, well, women and guys do up at RCS. Is that true? Yeah, I would would definitely say that's true. He's very, like, he's very committed to making sure everyone gets the most that they can out of what he's saying, you know, like, in a a sort of rep class with him or something, he'll, like, after we've played a tune, he'll, like, go through every person and say, well, you should work on this. Well, this wasn't so good. But he's also really good to say, you know, you played that well or that was nice. So um, I think, yeah, it's quite a natural, like, because he's a very natural musician, so he's quite good at passing on his sort of natural intuition for music. Right. Okay. Good. Um, 
do you um as as your time progressed at RCS, and you did more and more, you know, you became more and more proficient. Um, did you did you realise that you then wanted to become a professional musician, or did you still have other things in mind at that point? No, I think um, I think I think years before RCS actually, I knew I was going to be a professional musician. <laughs> um, I think I've always known that. Uh, RCS definitely solidified that because. Before RCS, I didn't really gig a huge amount, but being in that sort of student scene with all the student-led nights and stuff like that, I was playing quite a lot, you know, like a couple of times a week. Right. So after, you know, after doing four years of that, I think you kind of get very like, well, I can't really imagine doing anything else, you know. No, okay, right. So so any any sort of secret thoughts you might have harboured about maybe being a vet or a mathematician and no, no, definitely not. Definitely <laughs> not. Uh, I couldn't. No, I couldn't do that. I mean, I I used to be very into chess. Actually, I really liked playing chess, um, and that sort of that's what I did a lot before I started playing piano all the time when I was a teenager. Uh, and I got quite into that uh, like a year ago or so when I was playing that more than piano. But I think I've kind of come back to piano after that. Um, I don't think I could. Definitely not good enough to make it as a chess player. So okay, so so we might have lost you to the the professional chess circuit then. Well, I de- definitely not. I mean, <laughs> I would have uh, done very badly, so I would have come back to <laughs> jazz very quickly. Okay, and throughout throughout your time at RCS, you just you were you were performing and doing gigs. Can you remember much about that? Can you remember your first performance? I do remember actually. Right. Um, so. I remember there was two things that kind of that kind of kicked off my time at RCS. So firstly, um, in my very first week, I hadn't even started classes, so this was Freshers' Week, where it was just all the introductory lectures and stuff. Um, Tommy was having Bob Mincer as a visiting artist, and he was putting on a concert with Bob Mincer and some students, and he gave me an email. I think this, so I started on the Monday, then on Wednesday, he gave me an email saying, do you want to play with Bob Mincer? And then on the Friday, I played with Bob Mincer with a couple of other, actually with the bass player and drummer that I still play with in my trio now. Um, that was crazy, playing with Bob Mincer. It was absolutely an amazing experience. Um, and then next week on the Wednesday, in a totally different like vibe, I was play- I got asked to do one of the sort of main jazz student nights at this bar called the Butterfly and Pig. Um, and that was the, with the same guys that I'm still in the trio with, again, plus uh, a French saxophonist who's written a bunch of new music. And uh, that was a really good gig as well. And I think after that, I was kind of like, oh, I feel, you know, this is definitely what I wanted to do. Okay, so do you enjoy performing? Yeah, yeah, I, I love performing. Um, it doesn't. Yeah, make, it doesn't definitely. make you. You don't get stage fright or feel nervous. Um, not, not really. Actually, I think I definitely used to get very nervous, uh, but that's something that I've been able to um, conquer, like through sort of various things. Uh, I met. I for a while. I still do, but for a while, I meditate is like really a lot, just to sort of have more control of my mind, so I can kind of. If I'm feeling nervous, at least about music, I can control that. Um, I still get maybe nervous about other things, but gigs generally, unless it's a really high pressure situation, it doesn't frighten me too much. No. Okay, so and and you're not you're not concerned about having to improvise in front of a large number of strangers, some of whom might be quite knowledgeable or critical. Uh, no, not not at all. I think I actually find playing written written down music a lot harder than improvising though, because so much of what I've been doing is improvising, so that feels more natural than looking at a page and reading off that. So I think, um, like at some point, I want to do a sort of concert of classical repertoire. Um, so I think that'd be a nice thing to do. Uh, but I think I'd be a lot more nervous for that than I'd get for jazz gigs, yeah, for definite. Because you wouldn't be improvising. Yeah, I was kind of like, it's almost like you don't. If you make a mistake in improvising, that's like a good thing because that leads to really that leads to exciting things. But if you make a mistake in classical music, it's kind of like it's hard. It can be hard to recover from that sometimes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, 
Tell me a bit about the Scottish jazz scene, because looking at it from where I sit in Sweden, I mean, um, it seems incredibly active, um, quite small, but, but um, there's a lot <coughs> going on. Um, and uh, am I right in that, or am I just sort of looking at it with rose-tinted spectacles? Yeah, I definitely say that's totally right. Uh, yes, yeah, it's a funny one because the scene, the musicians are amazing. Like some, like all everyone that I get to play with, I think is a you know great musician, worthy of like international scene kind of thing. But the sort of the gigs and promotion and stuff aren't there to support that at the moment. Um, the jazz festival circuit is quite good around Scotland, but in terms of like regular gigs and stuff like that, it's okay. But like, if there was, you know, if because like in Stockholm you've got Fashing and the Glenn Miller Cafe and you know really good jazz clubs like that, and that doesn't really, you know, there's one in Edinburgh and sort of one in Glasgow. It doesn't really exist in the same way. Um, so there's amazing musicians, but unfortunately at the moment it's kind of like there's not. A total facility for that but I think it's it's definitely changing um more stuff you know a new place is just opened in Glasgow more stuff seems to be kind of happening so hopefully you know hopefully that'll change that, that brings us neatly to your own trio with um mm-hmm. with, uh, David David Bowden on bass and Stephen Henderson on drums and yep. um and the album that you released your debut album uh back uh, uh, earlier, earlier this year remind me when it was um, Fergus, I can't quite remember. Uh, it was called uh, Churras. Yeah. I know, yeah. This is like some, this is like a sort of Michael Parkinson interview where I say, haven't you, you've got a new album out, haven't you, Fergus? Uh, sorry, tell me about that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Turris, right, Turris, so it, this seemed to have been a, a an album that was a long time in the making and reading the notes you put on your um uh, website that accompany the tracks. It seems that some of them were, had their, you know, genesis quite a long time ago. Others were yeah. more recent. So how do you how do you feel? You know, now that the album's been out and, and it's got some very nice reviews, actually. Um, are uh, you happy the, with the way it turned out? Well, yeah, it's, that is funny because usually when I record. Like when I'm on a recording, if I listen back to it a year later, I'm like, oh god, that's terrible. <laughs> um, like I'm quite self-deprecating in that way, maybe, because um, I feel like you know, after a year, you kind of your musical sense changes and stuff. And, but I think I think I would play that album differently now, but I'm still really happy with it, if that makes sense. Yes. Uh, yeah. Because because uh, I worked I worked. From, really hard on making sure that the tracks ran and told a nice story and you know we rehearsed like we rehearsed really a lot to make sure the sound was nice so I think um I think like I'm, I'm really proud of the record that I made I don't I wouldn't I think I write maybe kind of similar-ish but not I don't think I play exactly like that but uh um yeah I think even like even now, about a year and a half after I actually went to the studio to record it, I'm still happy with it, which um, which is good because that's not usually how I would feel about something I've done. Okay, right. So, um, but notwithstanding that, it seems to be. I mean, Taurus is very much. It, it's. I mean, Taurus is. I think Gaelic for journey, isn't it? <clears throat> yes. Yeah, it is. And um, you, it's the the album is is conjures up a sort of a. a, 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 a a distinct sort of um, sense of Scottishness, and I and I, was that deliberate, or is that you know coincidental? I think uh, it is deliberate in a sense. Like I knew I was doing that, but um, you know, I want to I want to avoid anyone ever thinking that I've just uh, thought, oh, it would be cool if I put Scottish music and jazz together, um, and just doing it kind of facetiously. You know, that's not how that's not how I came up with it. It's more that when I started composing a lot, that Scottish influence, you know, because I, I kind of listened to a lot of Scottish music when I was younger as well, and I used to play the bagpipes for quite a bit of time, so I know <laughs> Scottish music quite well. And also I'm from Scotland, uh, so that, that helps. But I think just naturally when I was writing, it sort of started to come through that I was writing in a kind of folky way, and then the more I wrote, the more I kind of let that come forward. 
Yeah. Uh, so I think it's just I knew I knew that I was doing it, but it's more like a self, subconscious thing that uh, I tend to write stuff. I tend to like to write stuff that it sounds kind of jazzy, but also sounds kind of Scottish. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think I think you know I th- I think that. Um listening to that album now I had a re- quick re-listen this morning as well I couldn't listen to it, uh, everything again but um, yeah. I, I heard a lot of kind of Nordic and Scandinavian um, shades in it and um, I, I think I don't know whether that was have you been influenced by many Scandinavian artists oh yeah definitely um, one of I mean, one of my absolute heroes is Jan Garbrek like I think he's one of the best musicians ever he's incredible right. um, and just that general Nordic thing I think I listen to a lot of Nordic jazz I think that comes from like my obsession with ECM the German record label um, any record on that I, I love instantly just because of the you know aesthetics and the way it's being recorded and stuff I think it's really good yeah um, but especially the Nordic stuff uh, you know Jan Garbrecht's a big influence I love Harold Anderson as well Great, an amazing player, and then more recently, uh, Thomas Stronin. Thomas Stronin is someone who I really, really admire. Actually, is composing. He's a drummer as well. Who writes? Yeah, another and, drummer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, I think his compositions are amazing. He writes so, so beautifully. Uh, Matthias Eich as well, the trumpet player. He is really cool, and they all like. What I love about Nordic music is that they write in a way which is, you know unmistakably Nordic in a way like you can you just know instantly what is I think music with a personality like that it's really strong music so yeah but I think I mean if you look to the piano bits I mean I heard you know call me crazy if you want to but I could hear bits of you know uh, Jan Johansson Bobo Stenson uh, some Danish players I know um, and they and you're right they have this they have this distinctive sort of um, sound that they, they can't really stop themselves from using. And I saw el- large elements of that in Tourette's, you know, when I listened to it. Oh, oh th- thank you. That's a, that's a big, big compliment. Well, I don't know. I mean, it's perhaps a reflection of the fact that, you know, a Scottish and Nordic cultures are not a million miles away from each other, are they? Yeah, that's, that's very true. Um, I think, I think uh, there's a big similarity in Nordic folk music and Scottish folk music, like a lot of the... A lot of the tunes are quite similar, and I think the tunes kind of cross over. Like I know, well, for example, the Scottish band Lau, which is Aidan O'Rourke and uh, stuff, they they cover quite a lot of Swedish and Norwegian tunes in their sets. Yeah. Um, so there's definitely, a, especially in the in a lot of ways, but especially in the folk music, there's a lot of crossover between um, Scandinavia and Scotland. Yeah. And, and, and in terms of the individual tracks on Tourette's, they, they tend to be on the long side, don't they? Anything from sort of eight minutes to ten minutes. There are a couple of shorter ones on it. Uh, I, again, is that deliberate focus? Do you prefer to write a longer piece rather than a short one? And how easy do you find that process? Um, you know, it's not actually... I would actually love if I wrote... If, I, if the tracks were shorter, to be honest, because that would make it a lot easier... Um, you know, most people like listening to short tracks rather than long tracks, but I mean, personally, myself, if I'm listening to music, I like it to be, you know, a long track, uh, you know, like uh, like 10 minutes, tw- like 50 minutes, 20 minutes, even like the Keith Jarrett solo concerts where a track can be like half an hour long. Like, yeah. <laughs> I think that that's really nice that because that's like a total, like, it's more time for expiration rather than just five minutes, which isn't. It's kind of a short burst of energy for me, rather than you know telling a story through a piece. Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of no, it's totally biased, and um, it just so happens that um, you know, like it's, it was like, for example, that the second tune of my album, Hard Beg, I kind of just envisioned that as quite a short tune because it's just a, that mel that melody is quite you know it's not that long. Yeah. But the way the trio arrangements came out, it's like nine and a half minutes or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's strange. I think that I just naturally, I think I have a tendency to prefer longer pieces to shorter pieces. Okay. And then and on this, your first album, it, they're all tunes um, composed by you, aren't they? Oh, uh, yeah. You, you weren't, you weren't, I, I know that you, 
you know, I've seen plenty of things, um, concerts or snippets of concerts where you're playing standards. So right. it's not as if you don't do standards. But it, again, was it you deliberately chose not to do any sort of MacReady interpretations of standards for that for your first album? Yeah, I think that was a, definitely a conscious choice not to do standards or other people's compositions. Um, I think the standards thing. I love playing. Love playing standards. Obviously, it's really fun. Like playing the old songbook tunes and playing like Horace Silver tunes and stuff. Uh, monk tunes but it's not that as representative of who I am than uh, if I play my own tunes you know because that sort of standards thing that's that's folk music for Americans in a way yeah. um, it's almost like I'm I'm never I feel like I would never do it as realistically as someone who's actually from America would the standards thing so I do it I do it because I really really enjoy it but if it if it's my own stuff I think uh, I'll do something more personal if I play my own compositions, um, and that's always like that's important to me in my own band. That's personal. What's it, what's it like being um, a young musician at the beginning of their career, and particularly in a field as challenging as jazz? What are the ups and downs, Fergus? Um, I suppose the. Uh, Hmm, it's quite a tricky question. I mean, the downs are obviously that it's not stable at all. It's not an easy career choice, you know. Um, I have to, you know, I don't make my money exclusively from doing stuff that I like doing. You know, I do a, do a lot of gigs and stuff that I don't enjoy, you know, uh, like doing weddings or, uh, you know, teaching someone that doesn't actually want to learn piano, though that could be quite depressing. Okay, um, so, so you, are, you are doing some teaching then? Yeah, yeah, I do some okay, teaching. Right, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, and I really enjoy teaching if it's someone that wants to be taught. But you know, you always get those people that have just been told to do it by their mums. Um, it's probably why I was like <laughs> casually, to be honest, when I first started. Yeah. But uh, it's quite like it. It can that it can be hard doing stuff that you don't. You know, it doesn't fulfil your creativeness as a musician. Um, but when you get the sort of at the same time, like when you get the gigs that are really fun. Um, and that you enjoy doing and you get a really good audience reception, you know, that's like really fulfilling. Um, so if you have a good balance of that stuff, then it's actually, it's actually really, I mean, just a really enjoyable life. Because you can always just like, you know, um, you Brit, like people from Britain love something to moan about. So it's, it's nice to have like that you know, rubbish gig to moan about or something. And then, you know, the next night you've got a really nice gig. Uh, so, yeah, it's... Um, I'd say mostly it's really nice. I think being a musician is a great job. So, okay. And what about what about the the self promotion side? Because ah, uh, that's uh, nobody, That's something that I yeah. Uh, nobody's going to do it for you. So um, yeah, exactly. And, and, it, and it is the thing that really grinds people down, isn't it? It's, you know, it's trying to get yeah, gas. That can be tough actually, yeah. um, because no matter how much of the self promotion thing you do, you could have you could have done more, like. And that's it's the same way with practicing, I suppose. But um, your self promotion can be kind of tough uh, because it's, it's like it's, it's in this day and age, it's especially difficult to cut through all the noise. Now with social media, everyone can promote themselves quite easily, whether the music is good or not. Um, so right, like being able to cut through all the sort of like, oh, this band's doing this and this band's doing that, and that band's doing this. You know, it's like. Uh, yeah, it's, it can be it can be quite tricky, uh, but I think I've you know I've been sort of self promoting my stuff kind of for a bit of time now, and especially when the album came out, that kind of you know I kind of realised like oh if I put in more self promotion, I could have maybe that could maybe have reached a bit further than it has so far. So now now I spend like I try and spend like at least an hour a day on self promotion just to make myself do it and I enjoy it more than I used to but still it's definitely a bit of a a bit of a grind sometimes yeah and and you know um what what what, what would you say to any other young musicians or any of your pupils who you know the ones who show promise and, and the ones who clearly enjoy it would, would you recommend I, I'd say that um <laughs> there's a really nice quote from Bill Evans who said 
if I take care of the music, then everything else will take care of itself. Which basically, it's basically means, you know, if he's get if he's a good musician, then like it should, you know, he'll be all right. And I kind of think like if you're gonna be a musician, the first thing you think about is the music, for like all the time. Um, as I think some people definitely get a bit bogged down in this sort of like promotion thing and trying to like, you know, push themselves before they've got something musical to show for it um which is you know you can you can do that if you want but i think it's just better if you you know you should always be thinking about the music like if i spend like an hour doing self-promotion you know i might spend two hours you know, practicing uh, and i think if you're good at music that's a lot more important than being good at promoting yourself so i'd say always put the music before everything else and that's where we had to end our discussion because the French horn in the background at RCS had become a little too intrusive for us to carry on. But I hope you uh, have enjoyed listening to Fergus as much as I enjoyed talking to him and uh, that you'll join me again on the next Fogarts podcast. <laughs>